Hello, everyone. I am John Atkinson, and with me here is James Dow, and we're going to do an interview on the arms of circumcision. I hate that word. It just means cut in circle. Um, so, James, if you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, you, yourself and why you're included in this uh, um, okay, my name's James Dow. Um, the reason I joined this is because, I mean, for me, I just want to, um, I guess, explore the, the harm that circumcision causes, and we can discuss those issues. That makes sense? Yeah. So you are yourself a... Uh, Circumcised man, or previous well, well, I I personally don't identify with that because to be circumcised it involves not having skin around the penis. But mm -hmm. if you're like me and you've you know gone through foreskin restoration, uh -huh. then I mean for me I no longer have that identity. Okay. Also, just a little more background. Then, so at uh, so what age, uh, or how many years ago? Did you uh, do restoration? How long did it take you to do the restoration? Um, I started in April 2019. Okay, so not too long ago. So you've made some good progress with restoration. Then. Well, the thing is, I was a loose cut. So, I mean, people who are dry, who are tight cuts, where there's pretty much nothing to start with, yeah. um, they have a, a harder time restoring. And they might be have more reason to start restoring because because they they have painful erections and it's difficult to even just use the penis as it is and so they they're looking for help but people who are loose cuts you know probably are less likely to restore because it it's more they have more penis and you know they're probably uh, fine with it but you know what I mean for me, I just I like the natural body, I like things as they are. And, you know, to to cut a part of the body off and say, you know, this isn't perfect, you need to cut it off, you know, I just that really, really just uh disturbs me. Yeah. Okay. So uh that kinda gets us right into the very first aspect of uh the the best of things that like I cover in these interviews, um, which is a starting off with the physical aspect of the harms. And the first thing I, I cover is what we, what's called the acroposteon. And for those that haven't already, there's actually a video where um, John Geishaker from Doctors of Public Circumcision does a, he does a presentation at a baby fair. And he, uh, he put up onto the screen uh, an image of, uh, I think it's a Greek statue. And it shows the um, well, the Greek statue. The guy is, is naked, and uh, shows the penis in the natural form. And it shows um, the part hanging off um, in front of the glands, you know, about you know, a centimeter long, something like that. And uh, and he calls that the acroposteon. And uh, supposedly, uh, before they started doing uh, Brit Perea or whatever, they. Um, they just cut off the they didn't cut off the discovering the plan. So it sounds like um, you got you got a loose cut. So do you know how much like what was your coverage index before you started restoring? Um my coverage I mean I could pull it back somewhat. Um I'll tell you this, erections were not painful, um, and, and it, you know, I could actually, you know, roll the skin over the glands, so I mean, I'm not exactly sure what the exact coverage was, but I will tell you that the skin that covers it now is significantly more than when I first began. Okay. Right. So, uh, but you... You believe that you had more than just your acroposteon removed? Um, 
I'm not sure exactly how much of it has been removed. Um, it kind of honestly makes me... Uh, I mean, it, it makes me uncomfortable to, like, even think about that. But, but, but I, I am, you know, somewhat relieved that... I mean, I've heard horror stories of, like, tight cuts or, you've, or even, like, where they remove, like, the entire penis... But I said, you know, I, I wasn't a tight cut and I wasn't, you know, botched, even though, I mean, all circumcisions by default are botched, but like hyper botched. Yeah. You know? yeah. Okay. Um, so the next thing is sensitive skin. So a lot of people get the idea that it's not sensitive skin, that it's just a flap of skin or, or whatever. You know, it, it has no value or whatever, but I'm, I'm assuming you believe that what was removed was skin that had nerves in it and that it, that it is sensitive skin. Well, all skin has nerves in it, so to say that it won't reduce sensitivity, I mean, you either are flat out lying or you just don't understand how skin works because you can't remove something you can't remove skin and expect that it won't affect sensitivity when all skin had sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah, it's got nerves in it, right? Yeah, yeah. it's kind of like, uh, I, I actually have this post on my Twitter uh, pinned to the very top, that it, it, and this it, it addresses the Basio study, and it says, well, saying that removing your finger uh, doesn't reduce sensitivity is like, you know, because your hand still has sensitivity. <laughs> Uh, you know, saying saying that the, I don't remember exactly what it says. <laughs> Maybe I should go look here real quick. Um, so saying that removing the foreskin doesn't reduce penis sensitivity is a bit like saying that removing the pinky finger doesn't reduce hand sensitivity. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. So, and then I and then I refer reference uh, refer refer to um, Brian Arp's discussion on the addresses of the Bosio study. All right, uh, glands protection. Um, so you've been restoring, and do you feel that your glands is more protected? Well, not just protected, but prior to the restoration, they were basically the same color as the rest of the penis. Now they're their own color, and they actually shine. Yeah. So, and, and they're much, it's much like, I mean, before it was like a black and white movie, but now I can actually like feel it. And when like I unroll, or my glands get unrolled, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can actually like, feel the air touching the glands, which I never would have felt before before I did this. Wow. Yeah. So. Um, I know what that feels like. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so the next thing is a rolling mechanism. So, um, you said that you had uh, your loose cut, and now you're, now you've got some coverage of the clan, so, uh, so that, you know, it's, a lot of people think that it's just, you know, skin, but it, it's, it's a double fold of skin, right? So when it, when, uh, when the penis becomes erect or whatever, you kind of get that rolling me mechanism where it unrolls down the penis, and that's like a, you know, like a bearing. Um, so things kind of stay in place, you don't get as much friction. Is, is that uh, your experience? Mm, you're, you're saying that, can, can you repeat that question, or part of it, I'm sorry. Okay, so you have this rolling mechanism, because it, it's, it's not just a flap of skin that, like, I don't know, that just flaps around there, it, it's, it's a double fold of skin, right? So, okay. So, like, you know, when you insert the penis, um, you, you don't have, you don't have that friction like this, it unrolls. And yeah, it unrolls. It, right? it unrolls now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, guys like me that have a tight, um, tight cut, uh, high end tight sometimes is what it's referred to, I don't have 
that rolling mechanism. Um, even when I'm faucet, I don't have any covers, so I'm not nothing's really unrolling for me at all. So, do you think that you gain more rolling mechanism functionality with uh, after restoring? Oh, absolutely. You're a lucky step. <laughs> Okay, uh, moisture or lube, so you said that it's, it's shinier, right? So I'm assuming that it's shiny because there's some you know, kind of fluid or whatever in between the, the glands and the and the inner part of your foreskin, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, kind of, that kind of leads me to another thing I don't really cover in specifics, but um, maybe it would be interesting for you. So... For me, I, I think that I was cut with a like a Mogan clamp or a, the you know, I might might have been a Jewish Brazil where you know, they just pull the skin up and they they cut at the top instead of using a bell clamp, right? And what I notice is you look at a lot of different penises and you notice that there's you know you have two tones of skin, right, on the second size penis, um, and that that one tone is sometimes large and sometimes it's, it's small. And what I believe is that when it's small, that means that the person was um, cut using a bell, like a um, Domco clamp or a plastic bell, versus a um, a Mogan clamp. Do you? Uh, how much uh, intermucosa did you have before you started restoring? Um, I think you know it. It wasn't. I mean, it was obviously it. It was a cut, but. I have looked into different types of cut, and my conclusion is that my cut was, was again, it was a loose cut. I, as for the exact uh, tool that would have been used, I'm not exactly sure what method would have been used, whether it was Gonko or whatever, but, 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 Based upon what I've seen in, in my examinations, my conclusion is that it was a loose cut. Okay. Um, so the reason why I was asking is because you, you've done restore, restoration, so you, that would have pulled, you know, pulled your your skin up. Um, would that would do you have? Do you think that you have inner mucosal skin on your glands, or do you think that it's like shaft skin on your glands, or a little bit? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. All right. Um, I kind of wonder you know, how how things turn out for different men that, that have done restoration and whether you know if, if, if they do. I you know some guys I, I know they don't have they don't have any intermucosal left already all below their glands. Okay. So I just kind of imagine that. Pulling um, shaft skin up onto the glands instead of pulling intermucosal skin up onto the glands probably have different results as far as moisture and move and all that. But just kind of wondering. Frenulum, <laughs> so, um, do you? Uh, how much of your frenulum do you think was ablated? I didn't understand what you said. Uh, your frenulum. How much uh, do you think is? missing you know i i've looked at it i think i have actually a, a fair amount of it as far as is there a part of it missing you know there are, i'm not exactly sure how much of it was cut but i have looked at like where that is and they're actually thankfully not all of it was removed what about yours well um i I don't have the part like underneath your tongue where you have the you know thing that pulls your tongue back down or whatever. I don't have that anymore, but because I have all my intermucosal, um, all of that like right underneath the glands is still there. So I I definitely have a lot of sensitivity right underneath the glands. So I, I I've heard of guys that get cut where you know it's like the doctor like freehanded up underneath the the glands. And carved out all of the frenulum, right? That that did not happen to me. So because I was cut um, the way I was saying, I've got my intermucosal. It's like half my shaft is intermucosal when I'm 
why I have no action. So I um, all my spring on, other than the part that you know pulls it up, is there. So. Okay. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I don't. You watched the American Circumcision documentary, right? Um, the what documentary? American Circumcision. Um. You know, I've heard a lot about it that I've heard about it like a lot in the intactivist community. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually have not seen it, but I I really do need to watch it to yeah. quite honestly. Well, one one of the parts, um, the as a doctor is cutting the child, he talks about going in there and, and snipping the the screen on taking taking care of that. <laughs> like uh, <laughs> so I it seemed like I, you know, he didn't have exactly a close up, but it seems like he just went down there and snipped the part that would have been pulling up on the <clears throat> on the foreskin, so it doesn't continue to pull up the skin onto the glands. So, uh, it's kind of funny because uh, it, it, since it is a lot like the friendly on my tongue, my oldest son son was actually born with a tongue tie, and that was because his this friendly one was pulling back on his tongue so much. When he tried to stick his tongue out, it kind of forked. Although, you know, the penguin was pulling it back. And um, we just took him in, like, the next day, and he just did a quick little snip of the penguin underneath his tongue. And that totally released his tongue. Like, his tongue automatically just started sticking out like a regular tongue. Yeah. Okay. He didn't, he didn't cut too much. <laughs> just kind of make it, you know, like the average, you know, tongue. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, the next one on this hairy shaft, uh, slash scroll webbing. Um, do you feel like you've had any of that kind of issue? I mean, since you were loose cut, I'm assuming not. Um, I think to an ex well, to an extent, and I think part of that is when you do restore, it actually does pull up some of the shaft skin and some of the scroll skin. Mm -hmm. So, de facto, you are going to have some hair. Um, but I think as time progresses, the hair probably will decrease from the shaft. Yeah, because it's like the, the, the restoration tools I've seen, they, they just grab like here and they pull up, right? Um, yeah. Using your the end the glands as a, as a counter measure. Um, so you're you're pulling everything from that point down, which is, you know, you, you get your pelvic floor and you have your, your scrotum up. Um, whereas what you really want to do is you want to just stretch out the skin that is either your intermucosal or your, um, your shaft skin. And that's my problem with, um, with restoration is I don't want to stretch the intermucosal part. That, that, as far as I'm concerned, that I've got plenty of that. I only want to stretch a little bit of, um, of shaft skin that I have left over. So the part below the intermucosa and above the scrotum. So that's <laughs> not very much skin to work with. So that's why I've avoided respiration. Yeah. Oh. Well, well I, I'm very sorry that, that that happened to you, you know, being a tight cut. Um, yeah, that, that's just brutal. Yeah. And I've met, I've talked to one, one other guy that I think he has the same kind of cut I have. And he he's tried to restore for years and just hasn't really gotten hardy anywhere with it. Yeah. Uh, this kind of leads on to the next one, which is testes. So, because for me, the tight cut pulls up on my testes, um, th this kind of stopped happening after my testes dropped because of gravity and all that. But um, in my 20s and even into my early 30s, uh, of course, my teens, um, when I get an erection, it would pull up on my testes so much so that my testes, uh, the skin around my testes would get tight and pull my testes into my body and um it'll be almost like you know someone grabbing my nuts and you know squeezing <laughs> just enough to where it hurts right so um i don't imagine you've had that problem i mean when you get an erection i mean 
by default, the testes are going to go up towards the penis, but I've never had it be to the point where they actually, like, like it's a nut grab, you know I mean? That, that sounds horrible. Yeah, I've actually seen some um, porn where um, the balls come up and they separate around the, the shaft of the penis, so you hold both sides of the penis during an arch. Um, so that's, that's very close to what I've dealt with. Uh, pelvic floor. I don't know if you've seen me explain this, but um, it's, I don't have any foreskin. So when when I get an erection, and since I have tight skin here, um, so this is a, this is the top of the penis, right? And this is okay. going to my my stomach. So this would be my stomach. Um, as I get an erection, as the you know as the corpus cavernosum is filling up with blood, and the erection is going out, it goes up like this. No. Because I don't have enough skin here, so you know it's supposed to just go straight out. And if you, know, you look at the typical um, diagram uh, online of the of anatomy, you see how all of the corpus cavernosum actually stretches all the way back from your um, anus forward, right? And it's supposed to just go straight out of your body. Um, so for me, and from what I've seen with other men that are circumcised. This is what happens instead. So do you oh. have that problem? Or have you had that problem? Um, not to that extent. I think to an extent there is some curvature, but as far as it being that level of bad, no. I, uh, for me, I could like um, control my erection a little bit. I could do that, you know, make it, make it hop up, right? Like, it kind of seems funny, but uh, it doesn't feel great when <laughs> having sex. Uh, Mielocinosis, did you ever have any experience with that? Um, meal stenosis, um, that's where you have difficulty peeing, right? Yeah, the, what happens is the meat is at the, you know, by where the urine comes out. Um, it, it, it closes up a little bit, and or you get like a little skin bridge across. Um, and I, I had a skin bridge when I was um, seven years old. I'm not familiar with any experience, but I do know that meatal stenosis is probably is probably one of the things that I would break that I would tell to a person who's in favor of circumcision because. I could tell them, hey, there's this condition that only happens in males who are circumcised. So it's like, well, why aren't the doctors telling you about this condition? <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe they don't want you to know the harms of circumcision. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the, uh, the forms definitely can use a lot of work on as That's another one of those attack areas. Skin bridges. Did you have any experiences with those? Skin bridges. Um, skin bridges where you get a connection between the glands and the shaft, right? Yeah. You know, it, it typically, you know, as you know, for infants, the inner mucosal part of the um, prefuse and the glands is adhered during you know early childhood especially during infancy and when when they um when they go and circumcise or repeatedly amputate they have to like stick something down in there to separate and break that apart and then then you end up having you know a, a certain amount of intermucosa below the glands and that your, your body naturally wants to heal itself right so it, it creates scar tissue so you have that the tissue from the intermucosa trying to reconnect to the glands like it, like it's supposed to at that time. So, I'm I'm not um, aware of anything like that, but 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 that makes logical sense that if you break down a part of the body, it's going to naturally try to heal itself. Uh. Erectile dysfunction. 
you think uh, you've had any effects that has given you that? Look, um, in the past, I actually have had some issues with erections, but but I'll tell you this: um, since the restoration, um, erections just um, are far easier to get. Like, I mean, before it would be kind of like, you know, nothing I'm doing can achieve an erection, but now it's like, if I want an erection, I can get an erection. So it's like, I mean, I do definitely think that having a, not having a foreskin um, decreases the erection of a man. Yeah. Right, so you have multiple aspects of erectile dysfunction. You've got the psychological aspect and you've got the physical aspect. So would you say that they're both at play for you? Um, you're, you're saying that, I, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. So psychologically, for, from what I've seen, and for myself even, um, so knowing that your penis isn't working the way it's supposed to, or knowing that it's missing something, um, or knowing that you're missing out on some you know, sensation or whatever, that's psychological, right? So, you know, people say, I hear this all the time, your brain is your biggest uh, sexual organ. So just thinking about the fact that you're missing out on something or whatever can turn it, you know, can be a buzzkill right off, right? Maybe turn you off. Well, I mean, for me, that I use that as passion for intactivism. And, and, you know, someone could say, James, why are you so passionate about, about not circumcising? And I would be that I'm trying to protect children from, you know, what, what, I should have been protected from and what you should have been protected from, yeah. you know? So, but what I'm saying is that um, because you, because psych psychologically now you know that you have um, your, you know, you got your glands coverage and, and, and uh, things are better than what they were. Um, you're not so distraught or depressed or whatever about the status of your penis. So that's, one last thing that is less, or one last thing psychologically that's likely to affect you getting aroused. Well, it, it's easier to be aroused. Okay. All right. Um, general botches is the last item. Do you feel like you've been? Well, I think circumcision by default is botched. I, I agree, as long as there, in any case that there's, um, there's not a medical need for it, then yeah, it's botched. But, but as far as like, what most people would consider to be a botched circumcision, I'd have to say no. All right, so uh, the next section is um, about partners, sexual partners. Um, so, and I've got this broken up in the heterosexual, anal, and homosexual docking. So, which one of these applies to you? I mean, I'm straight, but I actually haven't had sex before. Oh, okay. So, uh, do you want to cover this topic? In, in any other way? Um, we can talk about it. It's possible some of the questions I wouldn't be able to answer, but we can go through them. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm heterosexual myself, and um, but, you know, it, it doesn't really take a whole lot of imagination to think about this, because you, know, um, you, you think about anal, you don't exactly have um, any kind of fluid there, right? So, the rolling mechanism and the lubrication uh, that's built into the penis when it has its periphery would be pretty viable when it comes to anal. Um, and when it comes to heterosexual, like we were talking earlier, you know, there's women that are um, that don't necessarily get that whap on that you know might have to be. Um, so, again, that that lubrication coming from man and that rolling mechanism 
can be useful and valuable to uh, to uh, the sexual partner, not just to the man himself. And that the foreskin actually is built complementary to the parts of the woman. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're we're designed to work together. Like the rigid band. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, that's actually a good point. I don't have rigid band on the under physical. So even though you restore it, you don't have rigid band, right? Um. I'm not exactly. I'm not exactly sure about all the parts, you know, that I might still have or might not have. Um, as far as having a ridge band, I I doubt it honestly. Okay. Yeah, I mean, from what I noticed about restored guys versus um, intact guys, is you know, the the prep actually squeezes. It's got like the musculature in there, and it squeezes when, as the as the as the um, as the prepuce goes up. You know, when the you know when the penis becomes more flaccid and the, the prepuce goes up, it actually squeezes around the the uh, the glands. And um, like in children, it, it closes to the point that it becomes like a sphincter that allows fluid out, but doesn't let anything back in. Whereas with the restored man, it's a little bit more floppy. It's not it's not squeezing at the end okay all right so the next section is psychological um and so there's two sections for trauma that i address there's trauma from getting cut itself and there's trauma from discovering the losses the, the harm that was done to you so, start off with the trauma from the cut. Do you do you think that you were traumatized? Um, I think it probably has some stuff. Like I was told that when I was a baby, I had trouble sleeping, and I think there probably is a connection. You know, you you were you were sexually assaulted and violated, and you know, you know, by a pedophile, and you know, then you might have issues with sleeping and you know i kind of have an addictive personality so i mean is there a connection between that you know there probably is so uh so, when, when they say that when they said that you had trouble sleeping was it like the first so many days after you were born or in general as an infant in general do you have any memories of um of dreams that might be related. I don't, but I have heard people who do. Yeah. Um, how traumatized do you feel you have been as you were discovering the, the harm? Um, at first, I was actually fine with circumcision. You know, it's kind of like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, there was a point where I was even, you know, where I, where I said to myself, you know, if I have kids, you know, yeah, they're going to be circumcised. But, I mean, uh, as time has progressed and I've, you know, done more research, you know, I've come to the conclusion that, you know, no, we're not going to do this. And children should be protected from such, from such cruelty, you know. Yeah, so... Um So why, why do you think it was cruel to you? Um, you got a little buzz there. Can you repeat the question? So how do you... So you don't... You don't uh, I guess I'm not sure how to answer that, how to ask this question. Um, so there's these that stages of grief. Are you familiar with the stages of grief? With, with the what? Stages of grief. Oh yeah, I'm I'm familiar. You have denial, um, bargaining, anger, bargaining. And it doesn't. Um, I I think I think to an extent 
that that is a large part of why so many cut men are so fanatical is that they're in a deep deep state of denial where they're denying their pain and it's kind of like oh i'm not obsessed with baby penis and in fact if you keep talking about baby penis i'm going to come where you live and i'm going to beat you up <laughs> yeah i've seen some of those yeah you got picked, you've gotten picked on funny on social media about their stuff yeah yeah i actually had someone say they were gonna kill my sons on twitter i'm like wow <laughs> He's uh, been canceled from Twitter, but <laughs> so do you feel like you had to go through those stages of grief yourself? Um, you know, honestly, I I kind of do do I I would say yes. You know, I think that, but but the but the difference is that I think that I've I've gotten past the stage of denial where it's just. Where, where you just say, okay, this is a normal thing, and we're just going to do it to our children, because why not? And I think a lot of men are, are at that stage, but you need to say, okay, this happened to me, but this was wrong, my parents made a mistake, the doctor made a mistake, and is a quack, yeah. so but I'm going to be a better person, and I'm going to say, the buck stops here, I'm not going to cut my children. So. Definitely. Definitely. I just wrote a, a review just a while ago about um, a hospital where my wife's OB was, oh, it still is actually, he's now the chief medical officer. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, the next thing is suicide. I don't imagine you've had any suicidal um, thoughts about this. Um, I don't think it's gotten to the point where I've wanted to kill myself over this, but with that being said, the world would be a better place if circumcision would only be available to men and women who consent to such um, surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, psychological trauma to, or psychological, psychological effects of children. Now, i give a little bit of, of background on, on this because and children can be infected by this in many ways, but you know, I, I think of like children back in the barbaric days where you know people killed each other willy nilly and didn't really have any value over life. And I just imagine those children were you know, traumatized and probably numbed to um, to caring about you know life, living uh, you know beings and all that. Um, but still today we have this going on. Um, I often worry about my own sons, you know, they, they see me fighting this all the time and they, it, it puts it front and center for them that they see that people are cutting children's genitals by the tens of thousands every single day for no reason, children's genitals, and it really disturbs them. And, uh, and I have also seen plenty of videos where intactivists have taken their children out to hold signs or whatever. And I, mean, I, I think that's great that they get to speak out and you know that they learn how to um be vocal about their thoughts and feelings and ideas about things and uh but at the same time i i worry about them from a psychological level and you know, how is this how is this affecting them so what are your thoughts on, on that? that circumcision is related to to trauma is what you're saying well how is how it's affecting children because it's happening today. How, um, how, are, how, are, children, how are today's children affected by when they find out about this, when they see this? I, mean, I even, there's a friend of mine on YouTube, um, Mama Michelle. She actually witnessed her mom um, previously amputating a baby. And she talks about the story and how she was affected by it. I think it would depend on the child and the parents who would tell the child about it. I mean, if you have parents who say that, that you know, that, that this is just a normal thing, that, you know, most parents get their kids cut, um, they'll probably, they'll probably have a, 
a more favorable view. But if you or me or someone else who are against it were to say that this is what happens and this is why it's wrong, then they probably would be more likely to be against it. wonder if that traumatizes them how much it traumatizes them i mean it's traumatic enough that you know children are getting cut but even kids that don't get cut how are they being traumatized when they find out about this i mean i think if you were just an alien and you were to go and you came to planet earth and you were to read that that in america 70 to 80 percent of parents are cutting off a part of their child's genitals, I think the aliens would be would be appalled by it. I think that they would yeah. do great lengths to to prevent this from occurring, even even if they were a different species, because they're like, hey, this is crazy. You, you can't do this. This is horrible. Yeah. I would think that would be worse for children because they're you know, tied to this planet and they're tied to us, tied to the adults. Things, um, right? <laughs> but, but I think for children, I think a lot of times they follow what their parents say, and that isn't to say that a that a child couldn't be raised in a pro circumcision environment and grow up to be anti circumcision. But what I'm saying is that I think for a lot of children, they grow up to be like their parents, which is why it's hard a lot of the time to break the circumcision cult because you're just dealing with generation after generation after generation of just cutting, 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 yeah. and we're yeah. pro-cutting, and, you know, there's nothing you can do about it, unfortunately. I, I mean, you can speak out against it, but, but it's like, those people can be very, very difficult to break through, and th they can be a very very um defensive about it yeah so what you're talking about is the cognitive dissonance that's building up this you know <laughs> what you, you, you're taught something as a child and um and you're taught in a, a multiple levels in multiple ways i mean i you start off with being cut yourself as a baby and then you're taught you know that's a good thing is you grow older and then you're taught that it's a religious thing as you grow older and then you then you go to medical school and then you're taught that it's it's a good thing medically you have all these layers, you know, it's kind of like the layers of onion that you're having to peel back when you're trying to ha handle that cognitive dissonance. Well, it's it's layers of a cult. I mean, you can, you, you basically, you defend it by saying that it's, it's part of my religion, it's part of my medicine, it's part of my culture, but the thing is, if you're going to say that, that cutting that male genital cutting is a part of your culture, it's a part of your religion, and it therefore should be tolerated in society. By that definition, you should also say that the ancient Chinese practice of foot binding should also be tolerated because that's their ancient culture, and you should just respect it and let, you know, the, your neighbors who are Chinese, you know, bind their daughter's feet because, you know, they're their parents, it's their culture, you know, how's it hurting you, yeah. you know? We humans have stopped so many other things where you've stopped this too. Okay, uh, I don't imagine you're a medical professional. Um, I studied in STNA, but I haven't, it didn't end up working for me. But if you're asking, am I a doctor? The answer is no. Or a nurse, or are you no. working in a hospital or a clinic? Um, I, I work in a warehouse. Okay. Yeah. So I personally, I couldn't ever work in a clinic or a hospital that does this. I just, <laughs> you wouldn't want to trust me. <laughs> I'd be kidnapping babies. Um, psychological effects of a to a parent. Do you? Uh, you haven't really discussed this at all. Um, how's your relationship with your parents about this? Um, I mean, initially when I told them my views about it, they were apprehensive, but I overall have gotten, you know, to, to a point where they have apologized and told me that if they were to have another male child, they would not uh, subject them to, to such cruelty. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so, so I do think that it is a step in that even if they don't, they aren't on board with me completely on intactivism, mm -hmm. I'm glad that I can at least have a relationship with them and that, and that they would agree that they would not subject any future child to such depraved, uh, perverted rights yeah. like that. Yeah, so do you think that your parents have been psychologically um, saddened or, you know, have, you know, like strong feelings uh, after learning about um, the harms of circumcision? Um, I don't, mm, hold on, how I want to answer that. I, again, I don't think they're completely in agreement with my views. But, but they aren't, at the same time, they're not like, viciously pro-cutter, like where they're, like, like, I mean, some people who are in the circumcision cult um, can, can be can be quite aggressive and be quite forceful and just be downright mean to people who are into activists, but I don't view them as being that. I view it more as being that, that they're in the culture of cutting, but they aren't. I don't think they're fully on board with it, but they're also not on board with intactivism. Okay. So they're not uh, regret parents or um, intactivists yet? Um, I, don't th I don't think they are, um, but it's better than being a pro-cutter. Um, the last item on psychological is uh, intact men, and you're not intact, but um, you might want to talk to. I don't know. I, I did have an interview with Sam Carnes um, a little bit, and I've talked to other intact men about how they've been um, psychologically affected by this culture of cutting, uh, because. Some you know some intact men spent much of their lives feeling bad or whatever because they weren't like their friends or you know they still had their whole penis or, or whatever. So even even though they're not directly victims, they are victims of culture. Um, can can you repeat that question? I'm not sure. I completely no, follow. It wasn't it. really a question. I'm just talking about how intact men are also affected by this culture of cutting. Oh, oh, absolutely. And I think that they're the the greatest victims. But by being the greatest victims, I would argue that they're they're the great. At the same time, they're the greatest perpetrators. In that, so many cut men are just are just. Um, they're very vehement and defensive about cutting. No, no, I'm and talking about intact men. Oh, in ta oh intact men. Yeah, <laughs> uncircumcised men. Men that you know, oh, have I, the whole penis. And how I misunderstood. misunderstood, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, intact men, I think probably, I think they probably are, are a bit of, um, I want to say, intact men probably are less defensive about cutting, and I'm not. And there probably are cases where intact men have their son circumcised. But with that being said, I think they they definitely don't have the circumcision cult mentality and are less likely to be just dead on adamant about cutting. Yeah. So. Um... Well, I was referring to was that I've, I've come across a lot of intact men that um, they felt bad while they were children growing up for not being circumcised like their friends or whatever that you know they, they have their whole penis and they would get they they might get shamed because of you know or bullied at school um, you know there's well, I guess what I'm pointing out is that intact men are also harmed by the culture of, uh, of this. Hmm. Well, I, I think that if you have a person with half a penis who's making fun of someone with a whole penis, I think that there's there's something wrong with that picture. And I, and I would make the argument that 
if you have your whole penis, there's actually no reason for someone with a whole penis to be shaming someone with half a penis. Now, I, obviously, I, I don't think body shaming on either side is right, but what I'm saying is that if you're talking about body shaming and saying that a person is incomplete or that it's deformed, then I would say that the circumcised penis is the one that's deformed and it's the one that's abnormal. I agree. Yeah, I'm just trying to adjust the psychological effects of the entitlement. All right, so uh, the next thing, next section is about relationships. And the first section, first part of that is child parent trust. Do you feel that you, that this has affected your trust level of your parents? Or, you know, for, between you and your parents? Um. I definitely feel uncomfortable about th that being an aspect of something that they would say is okay or that we're going to do. Um, and, and I mean, it, it makes me uncomfortable to think about that. Um, as far as has it affected the trust level, I mean, I don't think, you know, my, my parents would push me over a cliff or, you know, throw me into the ocean. You know, I don't think that they would intentionally try to kill me. I think that this was just a really, really bad decision on their part. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, they they failed to research or whatever on that topic. What else do you think that they might fail to, to research when it comes to your your happiness or safety? Well, I think, you know, that if you're going to fail in that regard, you know, you know, I think you could fail about pretty much anything at that point. Yeah. So. Okay, so uh, the next thing is co-parenting. Uh, you're not a parent yet. No. Um, that's there's something you want to say about that, um, that aspect of this. Um, so, so what you're saying is that, I mean, I, I'm not a parent yet, but that if I were to be a parent, I would leave my children intact. Um, is that what you're asking? No, no, so this is about relationships again. So this would be relationships between two parents. So okay. let's, let's say you have one parent that is for and one parent that is against. Um, what would the dynamics be there? Well, I think that what you need to do is, is first of all, rather than have it be a fight, or, I mean, there's actually a video on my TikTok where the parents are disagreeing about circumcision. It was a deleted scene from the movie, from the movie but what I would say, quite simply, is that you would find the parent who's against, and you would... You, you would say to them that that this that in regard to this surgery that that this is what is taking away and this is why we can't do it and I would say that if if they're still um, for it to to watch a video of it I mean if you watch a video of it you can just you can hear that this just um, horrific just scream that that doesn't even sound real it sounds you know just and, and there's a reason why the why the cutter takes the parents away from the child when they perform that detestable act is because if the parents were in the room when it happened uh cutters would go out of business no one would yeah. virtually no one would be subjecting their child to this it just no one would do it. It would be exposed as it is. I think part of why it is decreasing is because videos on YouTube and whatnot show the cutting that happens. That it shows, you know, the cruelty, the horror. And, you know, I think a lot of people just say, okay, enough's enough. We're not going to subject this level of cruelty onto the child. So I think watching a circumcision video, even if you don't know the function of the foreskin, that that is a great way to to break away from the cult of circumcision. Yeah. A lot of, you know, I've heard of cases where people have gotten divorced over this topic. It's kind of 
sad that people don't talk about before they get into, <laughs> you know, get married or whatever and decide to have kids together. But yeah, you know, it's it's definitely something that uh, tears uh, relationships apart. And I'd really like to see a world where this where cutting just wasn't even a question, where it wasn't even something that was brought up. Well, for me, I wouldn't ever date a woman who says that we're going to cut the kids or, you know, or something like that. I mean, yeah. That'd be, that'd be it for you, right? <laughs> the end. No relationship there. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next section is mother-child bond. Um, now, this kind of gets into a gray area a little bit because... It kind of depends on how long the child was taken away, how soon the child was taken away uh, for the procedure to be done. Sometimes the procedure is done the same day after like a birth, and sometimes it's you know, done seven, eight days later. Um, but in, both, in all these cases, the, the baby is being taken away from the mother for a period of time. What do you think on what's your um, views on that aspect? About taking away the child from the mother. Well, the mother-child bond and, and how it's how it's affected by. The um, computer. I've read cases where the where it, you know you got there's puffiness involved. Um, the the bonding is broken. Breastfeeding is impacted. So, do I think that the it affects the bonding? Absolutely. Do you think that you'd have a better relationship with your mother if it didn't happen to you? Um, probably. Uh, pedophilia. I don't know if you saw my video. I actually talked a little bit about how this can contribute to pedophilia. But there's there's that multiple aspects of pedophilia to this. I mean, there's uh, a lot of people call the the the, the cutters. The, doctors that do the cutting or the moils or whatever, pedophiles themselves, but um, I, what I brought up in one of my videos is that the lack of the you know, prep use can actually contribute to desires, um, pedophilic desires. What are your thoughts on that? Um, do I think it's connected to stuff like that? Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, it seems to me that if you, you know, you welcome the baby into the world, a knife to the genitals, they probably will, um, they probably will go towards depraved sexual practices, okay. you, you know? Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like the... Um, so since I can't trust a doctor that does the, this procedure. To, I agree with you. I, so my PCP cannot be a circumciser. Just can't. Me too. I, I just, I don't, I wouldn't trust that doctor. And, and the fact that doctors support it at all, um, worries me. I, if, if they don't understand the harm that's being done and they don't see that you know they're breaking their uh, the, the hippocratic oath is being busted by this how else can they be unethical when it comes to treating me for anything else i mean what i would say about that is the the doctor that i see hasn't actually performed circumcisions and what i what i would say is that if, if even if that doctor um, isn't fully on board with intactivism or agrees with it, at the very least, I would not feel comfortable seeing someone who's a circumciser. But, but they don't, having said that, they don't have to be fully on our side to, to be seen. You, you know what I mean? Uh, relationships between friends and family. Now, I know that you've gone um, all out like we on uh, like Facebook and stuff, uh, spreading the word about how you feel about this topic. And <laughs> it's definitely brought up some tensions between you and your friends. I don't know about family. But... 
are you? What's your view on all that? Um, I think I think it's good to have the conversation. I think that even if there is tension, or someone might you know be offended, or they might unfriend or block, which has happened before. But with that being said, the conversation needs to be had, and the more attention and the more um, the the more it's talked about, the more. It, it gets exposed because when you look at these conversations and you just look at them, I mean, you have, you have the intactivist who's presenting all the arguments X, Y, and Z, why this shouldn't be done. And the cutters really, they really don't have sound arguments for defending their position. So I, 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 I definitely do think that these arguments are for the better. Yeah. yeah. That's great that you're willing to tackle your friends and family about it, regardless of what they might end up feeling or, you know, towards you afterwards. I, I personally um, am very saddened with how things have gone with my own family. Um, how has that affected your family? I, I, you know, I always feel like the black people's family. Um, I've yeah. had I've had some family members block me completely, um, stop talking to me, or whatever. Um, some family members have you know come around seeing how you know my my point of view on it. But uh, other than my immediate family, my wife and my kids, I, none of my family members have like decided a whole assignment next to me or anything like that yet. No. Um, well, well, it's it's a uh, it, it's a long journey, but I, I do think that over time history will prove will prove the intactivist position to be correct. Yeah, but I, I definitely do think that it it is a an uphill battle, but I, I do think it is something that that is slowly but surely happening. Yeah. Okay. Um. Then I, the next item here is FGM or female genital mutilation. Of course, you use that word, you know, genital cutting cultures, and they're like, it's not mutilation. Um, and I, I have this on the list because uh, they use the same word for it all the time. Sometimes they use the word katna. It kind of depends on what, um, what part of the world he's talking about. Um, but my view, and it seems to be lots of other people's view, is that as long as male circumcision continues, um, the door will continue to be open for female genital cutting. Well, there was recently, a few years ago, there was actually a case where a judge ultimately ruled that female genital cutting can't be prosecuted be basically because they're respecting the family's tradition but and you could say oh oh that's appalling why would we do that but you know what i would say to you is that well why do we do that with with uh, circumcision why would we say you know to to cultures or religious groups that that this is your culture this is your religion so even though we don't agree you know when you're sucking the baby's penis you know we're going to say okay i guess you can do that and you know you can give the baby herpes because it's, it's your religion you know i mean i mean you can use religion or culture to justify literally any behavior i mean you could use it even to justify murdering an entire village just saying, hey, it's my culture. This is what we do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, stunning, you know, that's part of the culture. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other thoughts on the FDM side of it? Um, I, what I would say, uh, also what I would say is that it, 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 um, it, 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 it Puzzles me that Americans on one side, they, they say to countries in the Middle East and to Indonesia where circumcision is a part of their culture, 
what female circumcision is a part of their culture, and they say, hey, this is barbaric, you need to stop it, but then it's like, we're going to say that, but at the same time, little Johnny's on the chopping block, we're just going to cut him, but it's like, okay, you need to stop cutting your girls, well, we keep cutting our boys, so it's like, you're going to get absolutely nowhere doing that, because people look at that, they see that it's, it's garbage, it makes no sense, you know, why are you cutting your boys, but attacking other people for cutting their girls, you know, it's just, you're going to get absolutely nowhere being a hypocrite like that. So that that's my position. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to tell her to it, too. Okay, so the last item on the list is social productivity. And uh, I, I added this to the list because I see myself as well as many other um, advocates for general autonomy spending a lot of time um, advocating for general autonomy instead of doing the jobs that they were trained to do or you know, used to do, whatever. Um, for myself, personally, I, I'm i very distracted by this topic. And uh, I, I used to be a corporate IT guy. I, I still do IT, my IT work, but um, I don't, my mind isn't in it like it used to be because I've come to realize how bad this is issue is and, um, and I'm challenged in my own head on how to raise awareness about the issue. So, um, I'm not as productive as I would be. I, th I think for me I can balance it between saying that this is that at X time is when I'm going to be, you know, doing my day job, is when I'm going to be eating, is when I'm going to be sleeping, and then at this other time is when I'm going to be raising awareness about intactivism, and, you know, I, I don't think it needs to be a conflict. I would say that it, it ultimately can complement itself when you say that you're going to build a schedule for yourself where you do one thing at one time and another thing at another time. Does that answer your question? So you're able to compartmentalize it pretty well? Yeah. yeah. Okay. See, I, I even find myself when I'm doing certain work or whatever, still thinking about this <laughs> issue. Um, especially as a lot of work I'm doing doesn't require, you know, total focus. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, uh, that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, unless you have anything else to say about the any harms of circumcision. Um, I, I would say one thing also, and this is something I wanted to bring up. You know um, that, that there, the United States government has, has actually, there have been politicians who went after Iceland in 2018 when it wanted to ban male circumcision, where they were encouraging, encouraging the, where they were discouraging Iceland from banning it, and even that the Anti-Defamation League uh, wrote to I wrote to Iceland discouraging them from doing that, and they themselves as being you know run on profit were a human rights group, but then you just go around and you're you're attacking a country for trying to protect the human rights of infants, and so it's like you know why are you doing that? So. Well, I don't know if you read my blog, uh, johnhedkissen.blogspot.com, but there's one article, I think it's back in 2018, where I found um, a bill that was passed by, during the Obama administration, uh, or the time Obama signed off on it. And the bill is about relationships, uh, international relationships. And in that bill, it specifically calls out male circumstances. Um, so basically what I'm saying is that um, any country that persecutes um, people about male circumcision, well, that affects our international relationship with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, I don't think, uh, it seems like a lot of people don't know that, even even in the activist crowd, but I tried to share it with everyone. Um, so, yeah, during the Obama administration. And, and the thing is, Obama presents himself as being as being left wing, as being progressive. But then you're just you're going around and you're doing something that you I, I mean, you're you're really you're not. 
what you're doing is something that I, I would expect a Republican to do, but really in some ways that there is quite a bit of overlap in Republicans and Democrats, both in both in harmony, just defending cutting, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, why did he call it, why did they call it the word male? Why not just say circumcision? Because that would have included everything, but who knows? <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I kind of I think about the um, North Carolina um, bill that Intaction has been going after recently, um, where they snuck in um, circ circumcision for prophylactic purposes on children into uh, into the Medicaid system, and yeah. they, they snuck it in, you know, with a bigger bill. It's like so. It's like this little piece. And it's a bigger bill, so it's easy to just, you know, gloss over, skip over, whatever, and not see it. No, that's, um, that, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. So. All right, James. Well, unless you have anything else, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for interviewing with me. All right. Thank you. Uh, take care. Yeah, you too, James. Have a good night. You too.